And can I say, first of all, Mark, rest assured you'll be safe. My husband's one of the Gardaí here, so you'll be grand. A gune yushler a rish to live here in my vehicle show, agus mowias as up to encourage agus gune yadi and to live lig agus kogarja has marta slugo mower and show agus bejis bre brevin niwan and you ach erfodan charting. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much once again for the invitation. Uh, and Mark, you're very welcome. You've said this is your first time to Glenties, so hopefully it won't be your last. And uh, uh, also to our two other guests, one of whom uh, taught me one or two lessons when I was first appointed as minister, uh, uh, Jim, who's been exemplary and has been here before, uh, and to a new colleague. I'm afraid that he should wipe my eye when it came to his jobs announcement, so I'll have to go down and see him myself. Uh, but uh, it's wonderful to see someone who, uh, he told me, moved from uh, a small room into a large enterprise uh, with 800 people. So, you know, we also should celebrate success and we're delighted and I'm delighted to share uh, on the platform with you. I suppose really uh, the one thing I could say this, or this evening is what a year it's been since we were here in Glenties. The dramatic change in the tone of our debate this week is heightened by a perception of ourselves that has altered significantly. We've been reminded that Ireland is a small vessel on the economic tide. And this reality has been brought home to individuals and families across this country through job losses, reduction in income, or the tiger era certainly dashed. So it's a difficult time for many. So nothing that I, or for that matter, matter any of our guests say here tonight, uh, can take from the immediacy of the difficulties affecting families where a mum or a dad is struggling to find a job. But what I want to do and to, to say to that family is that we understand and we were going to steer Ireland through the current economic storm and she is navigating a determined course. And that course is a course which, if we hold with it, will create jobs and see Ireland achieve a sustainable level of economic growth in the medium term. However, it is a course that will not be without pain in the short term. We've already experienced some of that, and as we've all spoke of last week's report of the special group chaired by Colin McCarthy has indicated, further difficult spending decisions lie ahead for this government. There is a growing acceptance, however, that the need to stabilize our public finances, restore our competitive position, and get our banks working again is a prerequisite to recovery. So if we really want to realize that smart economy, the subject of our discussion this evening, we must work to overcome those hurdles. Only then will we have a solid foundation for investing in the knowledge, skills, and creativity of our people who will create the valuable processes, products, and services of tomorrow. So with this in mind, I therefore want to say a few words this evening about one of those hurdles that falls firmly within my own remit, and that is competitiveness. Much of my own work over the past year has been centered on the drive to, comp to restore our competitive position. And in certain ways, it's the most difficult of the three hurdles to overcome and on which to achieve quick results. It requires a myriad of actions across government and across both the public and the private sector. So be in no doubt, however, that addressing Ireland's cost competitiveness is of fundamental importance to recovering long-term sustainable growth and is a foundation stone for the building of a smart economy. To be successful, it is clear that we need all of the sectors within this economy to reboot to the new reality. In our exuberance over the last decade, we lost sight of the importance of retaining a competitive position. We must recover this lost ground quickly and restore flexibility and adaptability to our small but internationally connected economy. The need for cost competitive is now more pressing than ever. Unfavorable exchange rates, particularly with two of our main trading partners, Britain and the United States, add further urgency to the need to lower costs. Membership of the euro area means that an adjustment through exchange rate depreciation is not an option to us. Therefore, downward pressure on real wages and costs must be the main driver of our cost competitiveness and the future growth of this country. 
This adjustment is needed to bring our costs into line with those of our competitors. There is now, thankfully, plenty of evidence that this is starting to take place. We saw the decline in Irish inflation reaching minus 5.4 per cent in the year to June 2009. It is the sharpest fall since the 1930s. Inflation fell significantly across most goods and services groups in 2009. Input costs for manufacturing and services has witnessed several months of consecutive decline. And the OECD has predicted mild deflation in Ireland for the next two years. So this will maintain the current downward pressure on prices and wages. So while the Eurozone is also experiencing deflation, estimated to be the lowest in the region since 1953, the IMF believe that Irish prices should continue to decline at a pace greater than the rest of the Eurozone. And this in itself will help improve our competitiveness. The second thing is that government has stepped in to exert downward pressure on prices and costs. Although it has been a painful adjustment, the reduction in unit labour costs delivered through public pay reform will strengthen our long-term position. For most exporting companies, labour costs account for more than half of their input costs. And significantly, the EU estimates that Irish uh, unit labour costs will fall by 4 per cent this year, compared to a 3 per cent increase in the EU average. This translates into a significant cost advantage for those Irish firms competing in that export market. And thirdly, the government has committed itself to implementing the recommendations of the Competition Authority and tackle excessive costs in the non-traded sectors where they can best contribute to overall competitiveness. The IMF acknowledged the importance of the Irish labour market flexibilities in helping our competitive adjustment, and it also suggested that the competition policy should be used to support the process of price and wage adjustments. Competition policy in a small open economy is relevant for all sectors of the economy, but particularly the services and the non-traded sector, since it is the non-traded sector that is a key determinant of Ireland's cost competitiveness. The Competition Authority has tended to focus its efforts, especially its advocacy efforts, on the non-traded sectors of the economy. The Authority has used a number of reports in the past few years on non-traded sectors, including the areas of banking, utilities, professional fees such as engineers, architects, the legal profession, dentists and others. Implementation of the Authority's recommendations is essential to remove competitiveness bottlenecks in the economy and to deliver better value and more innovation within these sectors. It is my intention to submit a report to Government before the end of this year outlining the progress achieved on the implementation of these prioritised uh, recommendations. Across government, there is already a concerted approach to eliminate structural rigidities and competition bottlenecks that have contributed to high costs. Just last month, for example, we confirmed our intention to ban upward-only rent reviews. My colleague, the Minister for Health and Children, is also taking action to drive down health costs. And these are examples of the cross-government effort underway, an effort that must challenge vested interests across that sheltered economy. Fourthly, we are working to control costs in administrative sectors of the economy, such as local authority charges, as well as easing the administrative burden that regulation can create. I have now met several times with the county managers about actions local authorities can take to ease cost pressure on business. This is a difficult, uh, at a time, this is very difficult, and I know as a former local representative, a very difficult time when local authority budgets are already under pressure. But the level at which local authority charges are set have a very real impact on the ability of our local businesses to compete. Energy costs represent one of the key issues where costs need to be managed. And the recent trend of energy prices has been downward with a 10 per cent drop in electricity prices for residents and SMEs from the 1st of May, while gas has been reduced on average by 12 per cent. And these reductions will result in a further easing of cost pressures to businesses. The result has uh, been that, according to the latest published Eurostat comparisons, the smaller SMEs are paying 1 per cent below the average EU27 price, and approximately 60 per cent of the ESB's SME customers are within that category. We are also seeing greater competition amongst energy suppliers, which is helping to drive down costs for SMEs and for the larger energy users. 
We hope to be in a position to confirm further initiatives in the energy sector in the coming weeks that will assist, assist us in retaining jobs and maintaining lower costs, particularly for our large energy users. It is my view that we must never again allow costs to drift out of line with those of our competitors. We have learned a harsh lesson, but as a government we have acted with resolve and will continue to take the necessary actions to restore our external competitiveness. And there is much more work to be done. There are certain sectors where competition and the chill winds of economic reality have yet to reach. Certain professions have yet to play their part and have yet to tell us how they will reduce their fees and charges. There is no place in Ireland where the majority have to make painful choices for this level of economic conceit for any sector. But Ireland's competitive position is not all about cost. Productivity and the skills base of our people are key advantages. Last week, I was again reminded of this in one of Ireland's key competitive advantages. Grant Thornton ranked Ireland first out of 36 developed economies for access to skilled labour. Our focus on high skills, high educational attainment right through to fourth level is as relevant and necessary today as the investment in education when it was made in the 60s. It is also at the essence of the smart economy concept. It is about people, their ideas and the environment we must put in place to support them as they work to transform those ideas into commercial successes. That, in my view, is simply what the smart economy is all about. The truth is that we've already, we are well on the path of creating a smart economy in Ireland. Or perhaps it may be better said that we had many different paths underway, but all heading in that direction. While recent events have brought adversity, they've also brought opportunity. The need by government to robustly address the economic challenge and set out clearly the medium-term vision meant that from last summer we were working on specifically what that vision should be. That process culminated in the articulation of the smart economy, a vision that brings together in a new and more radically focused way the work underway in the enterprise economy, in our research institutions and in the innovation or idea space, together with work starting on the drive for commercialization of our research and development spending outcomes and in fledgling areas such as green tech and energy sectors. The level of investment by government in all of these areas in recent years defies the now overused sound bit that we bite that we blew the boom. A good example is the fact that expenditure on science, technology and innovation in my own department's vote is today nine times what it was in the year 2000. That level of investment has and is being used to support enterprise-led research and innovation, to help build and expand Ireland's third level research base, to promote the commercialization of research outcomes, to strengthen the collaboration between industry and the education sector, to help the SME enterprises to innovate. Its emphasis has been on building a stronger relationship between science and enterprise systems, particularly in the application and commercialization of research and development works. So while all of these initiatives remain essential, the smart economy logic urges us to go further. It firmly embraces the concept of innovation, not just in the science and enterprise research that we support, but in the way we approach problems and the challenges across all of the sectors within our economy. And I think we're, we're crossing over very much on this. Our ability to innovate and to develop new processes, products and services must become pervasive across all of our, economic and our, our academic endeavours. The convergence of ideas, and we didn't copy, there's no plagiarism here, the convergence of ideas from across disciplines must combine with the application of new technologies to deliver products and services that people firstly need and want. So to deliver on the potential of the smart economy, and establish Ireland as an innovation and commercialization hub in Europe, government must send a clear signal to all stakeholders and to those looking in from outside that this is the direction we are taking. It is therefore time, I believe, that we consider whether government funding for all research activities should be viewed through the same innovation prism. The delivery of all fourth level research funding through one body charged with an innovation grounded mandate is something we clearly must consider. Given the resource challenges we face 
and the level of funding we continue to ring fence for research. Research can no longer be for research sake. It must produce real events and ultimately deliver new jobs. There must be a greater return on the taxpayers' investment. A move of all relevant funding streams to one body would, I believe, send out a clear signal that Ireland has taken a key strategic decision that research, development and innovation are going to drive not only our path to recovery, but the economic progress of our people in the years ahead. The biggest challenge remains commercialisation and the spin-out of those new businesses in our campuses. So while it is a well-worn cliché, it is a fact that today's innovation ideas and fledgling businesses are the global corporations of the future. And my role as Minister, I want to take every possible step to foster a healthy entrepreneurial and commercialised culture, both among, on and off campus, uh, campus innovators across this island. Venture capital to drive growth and scale will also have an increasing role to play. We've seen progress in this regard over the past year, with several new funds up and running. Start-up businesses in the smart economy will need access to more venture capital, however. And that is why the government has made provision in the smart economy framework for up to 500 million euro to be provided through the Innovation Fund Ireland to support those early stage research and development intensive SMEs. With support such as these, therefore, the intention is that for, from innovative thinking, new business can grow, create jobs, and create scale at home. From there, their ambitions, goals and targets must grow and reach abroad. We have had some recent announcements with Irish businesses achieving success abroad in the construction, software, financial services and particularly in the food and beverage sector. This is ultimately the aim of so much of our investment in homegrown Irish businesses. We need to grow more international success stories out of Ireland and to focus our efforts in government in this regard we must set ourselves very ambitious targets. Foreign direct investment will continue to play a central role in the development of our economy and is critical to the establishment of a smart economy. Ireland continues to be one of the most attractive locations for global companies investing here. The quality of such investments is also of the highest standard, reflecting the remarkable evolution of the business ecosystem in Ireland as international competition and Ireland's economic conditions have developed. Investments in the past years, such as those by Intel, Cook Medical, Cisco, Boston Scientific and HP, are clear evidence of that evolution. So just as implementing the correct combination of policies drove the development of the IFSC, Ireland now also is fast becoming an international hub for a new generation of ICT companies involved in cutting-edge software development, the provision of online services and e-commerce. Globally recognised names such as Yahoo, Google, eBay, Amazon and Facebook have made Ireland their home away from home. And the dynamism of such names and the colour of people they bring to our shores sends out a very clear strong signal that Ireland is a vibrant place to do business, to generate ideas and to be successful professionally and personally. Key to those decisions has been uh, our pro-enterprise policy, our low, low corporate tax base our ability to attract world-class and multilingual talent pools. Just today, for example, I announced the establishment uh, by M Ampac, one of Europe's leading companies in the design and ma manufacture of mission-critical structural components. Now, you, you need to be up early in the morning to talk about that. Part of our European space industry. Uh, they have moved their headquarters to Dublin today. It is also notable that several FDI companies have established not just their European headquarters here in Ireland, but have located a headquarters for their entire European, Middle East and Africa operations. It demonstrates that with the right set of policies in place, Ireland can win not just on the European stage, but also on the global level. 92 years ago, almost to the day, the New York Times published a striking tribute to the genius of Patrick McGill. Introducing its readers to McGill's prose, the paper said to its works, Children of the Dead End and the Rat Pit, that they were unlike other vivid pictures of deprivation because they had in them the light as well as the shadows of life. Ireland today is far from that Ireland of McGill's childhood. Yet as we face up to these challenging times, it is important that we too look for the lights among the economic shadows cast around us. 
the opportunity to reset Ireland's competitive position and to reposition Ireland's economy as a smart economy are two of those lights and have the potential to eliminate the future trajectory of this small but very vibrant island nation.